Hi, everybody. I'm Nick Dawson. I'm the editor in chief of Talk House Film, and welcome to the third of our live Q and A's uh, for the Talk House Fall Film Festival. And uh, the films in the series are Eliza Hitman's It Felt Like Love, Charles Lane's Sidewalk Story, So Young Kim's In Between Days, and Todd Haynes's Poison. And I'm really delighted to have today uh, the director of In Between, writer and director and editor of uh, In Between Days, So Young Kim, uh, in conversation with uh, her friend and peer, uh, Miguel Arteta. Uh, what I'm going to do before, uh, just before they start talking, I'm going to put the the link to the uh, Talk House's Film Film Festival on Kino Marquee into uh, the, the chat so that everybody who is there can um, uh, go there. The, the season uh, pass is $20 for watch, to watch all four films, which is an incredible deal. I also should say, this is, I think this is something of an exclusive um, for anybody uh, watching that, um, Next week, we're going to be doing a round table for Poison, uh, a bunch of filmmakers who are fans of the film. Um, we have, we'll have Kelly Riker, Ira Sachs, Matt Wolf, and Jeremy Hirsch, and possibly some surprise guests. We'll have to see. But anyway, on to In Between Days. I'm going to turn it over to uh, So and Miguel, and I will let you guys talk, and I will happily mute myself. <laughs> Hi. How are you, So? I'm good, how are you? <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. I am so happy that we're celebrating your movie. I, I love your movie. I oh, think it's an amazing, you. amazing film. And I, I can't believe that it was, I think basically your first feature, right? Yeah, it was my first feature. And um, it's something that I made because I got rejected by these film schools. Like I got rejected from NYU and UCLA and I couldn't get into any of the production programs you know so yeah and then um i Lucky feel for us. Thank well... God. let's send them a fruit basket every christmas and say thank you for not letting her in now we have in between days <laughs> thank you yeah um I, I i haven't watched the film in a while and um so you know to get ready for this talk i was watching it this morning and, and i was telling you earlier before we started the official chat but you know it's like it's hard to watch your work isn't it Miguel like you you just want to go back in there and re-edit some stuff and put different elements in there and I don't know remix the sound and yeah it's, it's, I know what you mean I, I mean <laughs> the, the, it is true that we don't finish a movie we abandon it at a certain point <laughs> like you just are like all right I got it now going back, back to my yeah. life yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. it's amazing how little perspective we have in our own work because I just finished watching In Between Days and I, I love that every bit as much. In fact, I think that the movie has gotten better for me uh, with my life experience. Uh, I, I'm, so, I'm so excited when I saw this movie at the Sundance Film Festival, I think it was 2006, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in the jury and, you know, watching all the dreadful movies that sometimes, you know, you're, you're like, uh, all right, you know, some of, so all of them have something special, but most of the time what happens to independent movies everywhere in all film festivals is that like uh, they're three quarters of the way baked. Like mm -hmm. somebody had an idea, something that they wanted to express that was, you know, you can, you feel the intensity and feeling there but somehow in the shooting or in the editing or in the casting, somehow it's just like, mm, not fully formed. And um, when I saw your movie, I was like, just my mind was blown. Like uh, what you capture in those actors' faces. Uh, um, it, it's one of the movies that I feel like you feel the internal life of those characters through silent close-ups uh, most uh, clearly, you know, and like, like, like uh, you, the trust and love you have for those actors to allow them to articulate for you without words what was going on. Uh, it's really, really, really impressive. And of course, it's a movie about, about how tender teenage age is and how vulnerable we can be at that age. Uh, and I, uh, and it captures that 
so spectacularly. It's like, you know, it, it, to me, emotionally, it's of epic proportions when the movie ends, you know, like I'm just got it by it. But what I realized is so brilliant about the movie is like, okay, it's a, it's a brilliant movie about teenage experience, how tender we are at that age. But like what I find really beautiful about the movie is that you watch it and you do find yourself in the experiences of watching in between days at one point realizing that like, we all stay that way forever. That is the base <laughs> level of how tender and vulnerable we really are always for the rest of our lives. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and it's so beautifully to see it so honestly expressed so raw in such a raw way. Um, but anyhow, my first question for you is like, yeah. What was the impetus? You know, there's always a moment when you're about to make a, when you decide this is the movie I want to pursue. Mm -hmm. There's a spark of an idea that gets you excited that you're like, oh God, I, I, I sh that's the movie I should try and go do because I'm feeling this excitement at the, right now. And then, you know, we spend four dreadful years trying to recoup that excitement. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, what was that initial spark? That, 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 you know, what was it about the idea that you want, what, what, what do you want it to capture that you were like, I'm willing to spend, you know, everything to get this thing made? You know, I, I feel like I didn't really have that for in between days. I did for my later films, like Trueless Mountain and Fort Allen, but for in between days, I just wanted to tell a story about this teenage girl who's kind of in between two worlds and kind of floating. And I had the image of her, but I didn't really uh, solidify this character until I cast Ji Sun, who was working at a bakery in New Jersey. And then I saw her face in, and her working. I went and sat in her cafe and just observed her working. And I'm like, oh, this is Amy. She can be Amy. But um, I wasn't really sure until when we were shooting that the film was actually going to work out because Tegu, who plays Tran, was cast in Toronto at a nightclub, partying him, you know, partying like crazy. And he's French, Canadian, Korean. And Jisun is Korean immigrant living in New Jersey. So I wasn't sure if they were going to meet in any level of chemistry or whatnot. You know, you never know with two people. And um, you know the scene when they are uh, in front of TV and he asked for a hand job. Yep. So we shot that scene, I think second or third day of the oh, show. Man. And that was the scene we were shooting when I thought, oh my gosh, this film's going to work. Because up until that point, it was a total disaster. Like she showed up on the first day, she had all this makeup on. So we had to strip it all down. And, you know, second day was a disaster with the boy. And, you know, so it felt like this is not going to work until the third day when we shot that scene in front of the TV. I'm like, okay, we have a movie. <laughs> so <laughs> that, you know, that became the reference for the rest of the material that we shot afterwards. You know, if we could get this type of honest moment when it's like filled with this I don't know beautiful anxiety terror fear but like excitement because this is all new and her face is just full of this kind of I don't know I don't know how to describe it but her expression was just I don't know priceless you know and honest so yeah that was the one moment I, I guess that's our that that became our north star kind of afterwards and um did, did you have a, a lot of conversations with them to to get them to understand their characters or get them to understand the kind of you know raw honesty you wanted at them you know and it, you know it's so quiet you know like uh, what they're doing is so quiet you know uh, was that something you had to work to achieve or what was your process to get the performances um we I, I didn't really have that much time from the moment that I picked Jisun up from New Jersey and we drove her to Toronto. So we had conversation a little bit about the character. And then um, her first impression of the character was that she was going to be this kind of makeup wearing, you know, teenage girl. But we just had to like, I just had to keep telling her, no, that's not her, that's not her, that's not her. And finally we got down to the bare bones of really who Jisun is in an essence, you know, that gets conveyed through Amy character. 
So because, you know, this was like she was 18 at the time. It was first time for her to be away from her parents in her life. So she just became this very kind of raw teenager herself, you know, and she was very vulnerable. And um, I think the interaction between herself and Tegu, and she never, I don't think, had experience of love or sex yet. So um, I think for her, it was all new. And she was really on this journey that was very similar to Amy character in many ways. And same thing for Tegu, who played Tran. So um, it, it was, I have to say, I for me, my job on, you know, thinking about it was to just create the space for them so they could really kind of be themselves in many ways and felt safe and comfortable and it wasn't that much of directing really <laughs> uh, I mean um, directing is mostly about responding not controlling that's what I <laughs> what I, I have found out you know uh, uh, is uh, it's also knowing when, when to stay out of the way yeah yeah <laughs> you know? Yeah, mostly uh, I stayed out of the way, except they had a fight because I, if you remember that scene when Tegu asked um, Amy to have sex with him, like, hey, can we try sex? You know, so yeah. after that scene, ji Sun, who plays Amy, thought he was serious. So she said, oh, I can't be in the same room with this type of person. Like, I can't believe he asked me that. Mm -hmm. And then I had to bring out the script and say, but ji Sun, it says right here, he was just following the script. And she's like, no, 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 he really meant it. I felt it, so he really meant it. So they wouldn't talk to each other for two days. So we had to shoot, like, you know, scenes without them both in them, you know, so. That's amazing. Uh well, that's a, you know, he did a good job. You should have, you printed that take. <laughs> um, that's incredible. So how do you, what are the recollections you had watching it this morning? Like, you know. Um, I, I just feel like they did a phenomenal job. You know, I, I, I give all my like directing credits to them because I feel like how did they, how were they able to be so present in those moments? You know, because it, it, it it must have not been so easy for them. And I constantly, like every you know moment that I see, the camera was so close to them in their space as well. So I'm just so uh, thankful and appreciative of their craft and their dedication to the film. Um, you know, Jisan lived in that apartment. We all stayed in that apartment that we shot in. So in the mornings, you know, when she would wake up, I would have the camera with my dp go in there okay we have to film her waking up and and then you know the voiceovers when she writes her postcards to her dad that's literally like 5 30 in the morning so i'll, I'll crawl in there and i'll wake her up and say okay jisun you have to say this postcard letter because i wanted her voice to be very raw and you know vulnerable and have that come through in the recording otherwise if she was you know, doing the recording during the day, then she would overthink it and it wouldn't sound real. So. That, that's really smart. That's very clever. Like not, not let her, not let her conscious mind even be there. <laughs> yeah. and she wasn't, it was perfect. I mean, she was just spot on, you know, so. Um, did either of them continue acting after this? Well, I think Jisun afterwards, she went to SVA, School of visual design in SVA yeah. and in, um, visual arts in New York. And then she went to Korea, um, like when she was 21 or 22, and she tried to get into acting, but it's really challenging in Korea to become an actress at, you know, 21, 22 age, because usually they start training earlier, I think, and you have to have a manager and then, and it's, it's a kind of different, track so i think she ended up not doing that and came back to new jersey and worked um started to work as a designer more so i think that was much more you know grounded um, and did he go out to do other stuff i think he <laughs> he uh n i no i don't think so <laughs> are you in touch with them <laughs> 
I haven't talked to Tegu or I haven't seen Jisun in a long time since uh, New York when she was 22. So it's been a while, I think four or five years. Tegu, I lost touch with him after Sundance. So, but I, I think I got an email from him like six months later. He's doing well. He's, he's going to college. So. That's amazing. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, incredible to have that kind of intimate experience like that and uh, you know making movies is a melancholic profession I think because it creates the whole world and then it's like just goes away you know yeah, it's so intense for like a, you know a specific amount of time and then it's it's gone you know so so Miguel I have a question for you so how how do you you are directing a lot of tv and also big films as well how do you um like, how do you prepare yourself, like, for different modes of directing? <laughs> I, is it okay if I segue into that? <laughs> well, I have one more question about the film. Okay, because, go <laughs> Like, the script. You worked, yes. or you did it with your husband, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, um, was it based in anything real? Oh, yeah, the script is, I mean, the, the moments in the film are based on my teenage years of growing up in L.A. as like my, my family immigrated when I was 11. So I was a teenager in Los Angeles. So what happened was original story was set in L.A. And and um, all these kids are well, there there were more characters in the film. And uh, when I was a teenager, I used to go around and steal some cars with bunch of other teenagers so that was the original kind of story that I wrote but we couldn't find of course financing or producers properly um, so we decided to just take this uh, the story and then strip it down and then set it in any city that has Korean population immigrant population so it was either going to be in New Jersey um, New York or Toronto and LA was too expensive for us back then because we used to live in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then we just started the process of looking for any producer, co-producers who would help us out. And it happened that Jennifer Weiss from Toronto said, okay, you know, I'll help you guys. And she helped us tremendously with permitting and locations and stuff. And, and so when we got there, we just stripped everything down. So the kids are riding the buses and we, you know, found the locations that were the cheapest most affordable places like parking structures in the malls and you know but it, it just fit the tone overall for the story that I was you know imagining so it, it worked out great um but are the postcards that she reads your real postcards the what the, the postcards that she reads to her father are they, do they come from your life no they're they're um Bolex um 16 millimeter films that we shot when we were shooting on of all the locations that we um you know yeah. i mean the voice the, the voiceover that she reads i mean the the the, the yeah. post to her dad the, is that were those real or or is that yeah, written that those were all written by me for her <laughs> to read <laughs> um, like, you know, jisun like speaks mostly korean but the script was all in English, and so she had to, you know, translate from English to Korean in her own, like, the way she would talk, so. Oh, wow. Uh, and uh, it, you speak Korean, right? I do, but very rudimentary. I would say, like, sixth grade, fifth grade level, you know. But I wouldn't know a certain slang which they use in the film. You know, because they use a lot of um, street Korean lingo. You have to trust them with that. Oh yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> um, I didn't have any problems with that. And uh, I read Sar Sarah Levy shot it. Yeah. Have Sarah you... Levy, the actress. No, she's oh. a cinematographer. Yeah. I, I, uh, how, do you know? Do you knew her from from New York, or is... I knew I knew her from um, Brad, who worked with Sarah on short films. They both went to USC film production program. So, and uh, do you had a process with her? Do you knew the movie would look like this intimate? 
No, you know, the process that I had was with, with, uh, with Sarah was like, I would like it to be this close, however you want to <laughs> do it. <laughs> you know, it was like not a sophisticated process that I had with the cinematographer back then at all. Not that it is now, but, you know, I think Sarah and I, she would just show me the uh, framing and like, yeah, that looks great. Um, and sometimes I, I think we only had, I only remember one time, this one time where she and I had a disagreement, which was very minor, you know, where she felt like she needed to put a fill light in. And I said, no, we have to go now because we're just going to lose this moment. But that was it. And then she started shooting and everything was fine. But, you know, but otherwise she was very intuitive with the actors and she understood that it was going to be very much like a documentary style because there's it's not like they're going to these actors are going to go and hit a mark or do repeat the same you know action and dialogue at the same time you know over and over again there's not gonna there wasn't going to be a take two on any scene you know so you knew you had to like uh uh she had or she 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 had to be like super intimate with them too right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um yeah the, the level of intimacy that you, you feel with the close-ups is really just incredible um, yeah but you know a lot of people have a hard time with that too <laughs> they do i think so because it's it's a lot you know it's a lot to be that um close to somebody in that quiet level i think you know um, um i i made a movie like that recently i realized um, watching your movie i realized oh my god i think i was in, influenced by in between days a movie yeah. that that uh, just came out like um two years ago uh, called doc butter uh, oh my god i was talking to nick about how that's one film i um, haven't seen yet that you really, um, really look and, forward to it uh it's about two characters the whole movie you know too like and it's uh, all all super intimate close-ups like that um well to answer your question about uh, preparing for different kinds of shoots i mean I, I think you always have to figure out who you're who you're you know either you know in a tv show you're like a guest for uh, at somebody's house you know that's the way i think about it uh my my friend michael lehman gave me that analogy and it was really helpful because they like you want to be a memorable guest mm -hmm. one that they'll want to invite next summer again because they had so much fun with them mm -hmm. you don't want to be like the guest that like broke one of the walls and like now they have to rebuild their their guest room you know like uh uh, uh so you have to ride that line of being you know an interesting fun guest but not a destructive one you know um so uh, I, I always think about it that way. And, you know, they're hiring us to come to make their stories come to life, you know? So I always try to put emphasis on the story, mm -hmm. reading, reading scripts, you know? And this is what I do with all directing is I, I always try to, to figure out what is the heart of the story? Where, what is the sequence that is really the heart of this episode or this film? And make sure I, I can give a lot of time to that. Mm -hmm. and then speed through everything else you know <laughs> and uh i do that even with every day I, I i say what is the what is the heart of each scene and uh i try to like design enough time to give that close-up or that moment or maybe do something that that just visually reveals the heart of that scene and then i reverse reverse engineer everything Mm. And if I don't have time to 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 shoot it all, it all it ends up really working out. So mm -hmm. it really directing is uh, about responding and prioritizing. I mean, I think the hard thing for me is that you have to be very uh, aware and present, and when you show up, you have to be willing to see what your how your actors are feeling, yeah. what the feeling that you have that day, you know, even the environment, and be open to realizing that the heart of the scene is something different from what you thought. And be very quick on your feet, and and have and have the you know, the intuition to know that oh I I, I got to change my mind about what the heart of the scene is. Mm -hmm. So is that is that interplay between being like I know what's most important, but I also know that I could I should let it go if something else emerges that is more interesting. 
That's so interesting. Yeah. So going back to duck butter, is that um, I I haven't seen it yet, and I will, and I apologize. Is that something you wrote, Miguel? Yes, I wrote it with Alia Shaka, oh. um, and uh, we wrote a whole script. You know, when you were talking about stripping down uh, mm -hmm. in between days, it reminded me of that because we wrote a whole script with dialogue, and um, uh, um, in the script there was a, a moment in the first act where these two uh, people that are falling in love decide to spend 24 hours having sex every hour on the hour, mm -hmm. knowing that they're going to start hating the sex, and you know, they just want to do this experiment to stay up for 24 hours and try try to have sex every hour on the hour. And um, a friend of mine read it, and um, Christian Torp, who created that Danish show Rita, he's a wonderful writer, and uh, and he was like, I have to say this, you know, I just have to get it off my chest. It's nothing but 24 hours only, you know? And then we look back and realize, oh my God, Rather than trying to make this expensive script, we can add elements that, that we know are important to each hour. And so the movie ended up being that. And we showed it in real time. We showed it in, in 24 hours straight. Wow. Uh, uh, and, but we were able to put everything that we have been working into a script for a year into those 24 hours. And do it a lot cheaper. <laughs> so, but, uh, so we had two cameras shooting at all times because mm -hmm. we didn't know what's going to happen. We were working out of an outline and, uh, and ended up being very intimate close-ups. And I know what you talk about, like the feeling of, you know, the challenges in making a movie like this is that people feel claustrophobic mm -hmm. in your world, you know? And uh, uh, you have to buy in to one of the two characters enough to to want to go along in the journey, you know? But uh, I, I think your movie is very undeniable. Oh. <laughs> I don't know, um, but um, so I, I have more questions. So how was the writing process of you writing, co-writing with an actor about, you know, the, the story that you guys were collaborating on? Was that fun? It was, it was fun. Uh, it was accelerating. You know, I, I, I have written only a few things. i have very spoiled. I've been lucky to work with Mike White on a lot of That's things. Amazing. And um, so that's made it difficult because it's hard to write anything as good as him. Uh, so um, it's been intimidating. But um, uh, I wrote, uh, I wrote with, I, you know, I, I had worked with her in a small part and I just knew she was very young. She was 19, I think, at the time. And uh, about a few years later, I was like, we're going we're gonna to do this. And it took a long, long time. We wrote for two years and then threw away the whole script like a few months before shooting, you know, <laughs> like, uh, 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 but, uh, uh, but we enjoyed it a lot. Like, uh, you know, we, we were, we worked hard on it together and we just see life have similar priorities. And, um, it was a lot about like misguided love. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think that it was very, something that she was trying to find out in her life is she was very connected to the material. And uh, uh, it was one of those instances where we were both working things out that, that were relevant to each other and, and really fit together. So um, it was a really good experience. That's amazing. Yeah. I wish I could find a partner to write like that. <laughs> like, I find writing so challenging and painful. So, yeah. It, it is like vomiting. Like yeah. you don't want to yeah. do it, but once you vomit it, you feel a lot better, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Uh, uh, it's also a little bit like one of the best natural antidepressants, I think, in the world. Once you get it done, you know, don't you find it accelerated once it happens? Do I what? Don't you find it accelerating once it, once you're able to get to do it? Um, I don't know. I feel like when I finish writing a script or something, like it's more like I feel like I have to send it out for the next phase of what it is rather than like, oh, yeah, that was that was so satisfying, you know. But then I feel the same way about the film going out into the world. So I think it's a personality defect instead of anything with the actual craft of the writing or 
you know, craft of <laughs> finishing a film or something, you know, so. Um, do you have a morning ritual that you do when you're writing? Do you have like something, you know, that that is your, this is how your mornings go when you're writing? Yeah, I, I, I get, I, I, I've been meditating and then I do some walking with my dog and then I sit down and write intensively for two hours and then I break away and then I kind of either read what I've written or do something else that are that's unrelated to the writing so that I could kind of think about it, you know, until next time I get to sit in front of the computer. So how about you? <laughs> No, I have not been doing enough writing. I've been doing post on a movie uh, this whole oh, time, okay. whole pandemic. Uh, we just finished about a month ago. That's great. Um, Do you miss so, writing when you're in the post? Um, or... You know, uh, I uh, I have not taken writing as a habit enough in my career. I want to I wanna do it. You know, I co-wrote one movie with Michael Cera, mm -hmm. uh, Youth in Revolt. Yeah. And that was really great to work to write with him and i wrote with alia and my first movie i had matthew greenfield who now works at fox searchlight um he, you know we co-wrote the story together so i've had partners for all these writing things uh the only thing i've written alone is an episode of room 104. Um, how was that experience well it was great i did feel like i'd had a partner in mark duplass you know like he yeah. he's very good with story he is. Yeah. Uh, so he, he helped me a lot to get it to a good place. But I'm very proud of the episode it ended up being. Uh, uh, my favorite residual checks are the writing residuals for that show. Because <laughs> I'm like so proud of them. I'm like, wow, I, I got that for writing on my own. <laughs> wow, I haven't received one residual check for writing. So you're like amazing. <laughs> Well, you're amazing anyway. It's for all your work. <laughs> I'm talking about writing. Yeah. So, um, so, so what, what do you want to do next? What is like once you're, you're, if we get out of this uh, crazy time, like, uh, or are you trying to do something during this crazy time? Are you ready to get in, uh, on a set? I know you were going to do it. Uh, you're going to do episodic, but in terms of your own writing, is there something that you're pursuing? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think what was really good about watching In Between Days, again, was to give me a sense of, oh, I could go down to the bare bones of what the story needs to be and make, you know, tell a story in that way, which, you know, is really kind of um, empowering in a way. Go, okay, I could just have a camera and find cast, you know, non-actors and I could go and tell a story. So that was great. And then um, because I've been kind of waiting for this story, this script that I wrote about two years ago to get the actor attached and then you get the actor attached and then you get the financing and it's just such a long process. I'm sure you know. So I'm just trying to think of different way to approach it now. And um, I think, yeah, so it, it's, it's kind of like stuck in between like decision making, you know? Hold on a second. So, are you telling us that you had an, a work epiphany this morning watching uh, in between days? <laughs> yeah, in a way, yes. Thanks to Nick and <laughs> you, and Gal. <laughs> yeah. How great is that, Nick? This I is fantastic. It, it's, it's, there it's, might be a new wonderful film born because you <laughs> chose to do this. This is fantastic. I hope so. I hope so. So, yeah, it was kind of like reminding me, you know, what it felt like to just go out there and, and tell a story with whatever you have or everything you have you know instead of waiting for someone to approve of your script and your story and give you you know permission to make it so um i think that was like great um actually it's a, it's a liberating feeling isn't it yeah. like that, that's a feeling i had making doc butter you know at netflix so the, the, the duplass financed it you know with the idea of it, it, it going to netflix but you know, they, they, they gave me total freedom. They, they're like, if you can make it for this little, just do it. And uh, it was so liberating to realize, all right, you know, yeah. I'm just, you know, I'm willing to work for, for almost nothing. And, yeah. but now I can just do it. I, we can start today. Like, uh, uh, well, I hope you follow through with that. Is it the movie that you've been right, that you've been trying to make for two years that you may adapt? to do as a as a lower budget film or is it a I mean, new idea? 
Yeah, I think that's that's the idea. And then um, and then also I've been trying to do in between days as a series. So I've been pitching the in between days the show idea, and <laughs> it's been like such an insane process. I don't know if Miguel, you've done the uh, pitching process for a show idea, but it's it's um, it's been quite a journey and experience. So yeah, I'm trying to do that and. You know, hopefully something will happen. I don't know. Um, what was it like to work on Transparent? I loved it, actually, because I, for me, Transparent was so different than anything else that I've experienced as like a how TV production happens. And, you know, mm-hmm. I, I have to say I've worked on Ava's show, which was a great experience. And that was also different. But... Um, those two shows gave me my foot in the door to TV directing. And I thought because Jill's um, show was run that way and also Ava's show was run that way, that I thought every TV show <laughs> would be run that way. But that's not the case. They were the exception. Of course, Room 1 and 4 with the Plus Brothers is very, you know, auteur based and individual voice of the director, writers and stuff. But, um, but other TV productions are quite different. You know, it's, it's um i i find that when i work on tv it gives me chances to try different types of storytelling you know outside of what i would write so it's been super interesting to do like a sci-fi you know uh tales from the loop or do a crime drama or thriller or something but um that that's been really helpful i mean it's that's been the fun part it is weird, you know, like uh, um, Ryan Murphy asked me to come do the uh, first season of American Horror. Yeah. And, and I was like, what am I doing here? You know, like, uh, um, but it was really uh, exciting. You know, he was like, don't be nervous. Just, you know, you clearly you never do this in your movies. You never move the camera even an inch. But yeah. now in my show, you're going to, the camera's going to be moving every single <laughs> time. Like, do not stop the camera from moving. That's all you have to do. And I was like, yeah. oh, okay, I'll just do that. And, uh, and I did it and it was really fun. And uh, yeah. uh, I think I learned a lot from it. You know. Yeah, I, I, I find myself learning a lot from the experience of it. But also at the same time, like I feel like deep desire to balance that out with making my own films, you know, so it's like it has to be balanced in my mind for that to like coexist together. <laughs> I don't know if you feel that way, but I, I do. I mean, um, when you make a movie that, that that you write or that is that or that, that is very personal, you know, like it's interesting, you know, how those movies, you know, the universe doesn't want your movie to be born at all. There's no <laughs> zero cooperation from the universe. Yeah. In fact, the universe would be very happy if your movie was never born, you know? And I think like, you know, the kind of excitement that you were talking about watching the movie this morning and realizing maybe I could do this thing that I've been trying to make for two years, I can just go do it. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to, let that burst of excitement really like guide you. I mean, it is that burst of excitement that makes a movie be born. Yeah. And then, yeah. Like when it comes, hang on to it. Yeah. And write it all the way to the finish line. Because <laughs> right. it's so easy to be like, well, I was excited and now I'm going to let it go. I know. Um, um, that, that could happen so easily because there are so many, like you said, like the universe doesn't want your movie to be born you know and i don't know i'm i i think this is something that i'm really thankful for is that i feel like looking back on in between days because i didn't go to film school and because i had to learn as i was making that film that i'm really grateful for how much it has given me back like on everything that i don't know it's it's like it's a film that still gives back to me in many ways you know, and that goes back to like when I talk to um, film students or first time filmmakers, I always stress the fact that you should make your first film how you want to make it, no matter what. And that should be your all, you know, that should be your goal. Like it should be all you in that first baby, you know. So I'm going to jump in now, if that's OK. We have some audience questions and and um, there's also, you know, if you want to 
add, add more in the Q&A box, feel free to do that. I'm gonna throw some at uh, you both if that's okay. Um, uh, so this is to both uh, So and to Miguel. What is the best way to support filmmakers uh, in the time of COVID-19? Lot mucho dinero. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a tough question, isn't it? What do you What do you think, So? Well, I guess like uh, first because I guess the Q&A person is watching this talk, I guess that's a wonderful way to support the filmmakers, you know, first of all, because I think a lot of us right now are not like working per se. I mean, I love production and I love like being able to meet DPs and go out and talk to people and watch, you know, interacting with different people and meet new actors. And so I think right now we're very limited as far as what feeds our soul, like creativity, you know, per se you know if you crave like interaction between people or or um, creative collaboration so i think this is great i think film independent um has great like ways for people to donate and support that program and sundance does as well and i think they're all they could probably use support from people to you know push like give a little nudge and lift to first time filmmakers or young filmmakers, I think that'd be really great. Yeah, my, my advice is for people is to uh, try to be super present to what's happening and throw away ideas that you had in the past and, and write something new because the world is changing really radically. And, uh, and I think that the best thing, I think that for independent movies, not, a, not, not like you know mass entertainment, but for independent movies, if that's what you wanna do, I think you need to have like as a, a, a zero bullshit, if I may say, swear in this program, like a zero bullshit, like be really like adamant to examine your motivations for telling a story right now. And, and, and say, and be like, I just, I gotta take a risk and write something that, that where, you know, there is zero bullshit, there's zero pretense, there's zero trying to impress people for the wrong reasons. I think writing something very raw and honest in this time, those are the stories that I think are gonna get financing because of where we are in the world, in my opinion. So um, I think it's not a time to think about your career, it's a time to think about like, you know, telling the truth. So uh, that would be my advice. Yeah, I like that. Uh, so this, this, uh, this is a great question. Uh, what have been uh, the biggest challenges in each of your careers and how did you succeed slash fail slash move past them? Because I guess sometimes the challenges are met and sometimes they're not. So I'd be interested to hear about both you, uh, Miguel and So, talking about that. Well, um, hmm. you want to go first? No, you go first. <laughs> Um, you know, I had a challenge. Um, it's a little bit of what I was mentioning before. I, I, I wrote my first movie. Uh, Matthew Greenfield helped me with, with the script. And uh, then Mike White gave me two beautiful scripts, uh, Chuck and Buck and The Good Girl, uh, years ago. Um, you know, I don't think I had an idea quite luck, how lucky I was at the time, you know. Um, and um, but when I shot The Good Girl, I did realize that, you know, what a beautiful script this was. And, and it terrified me to go work again. I did not work, I did not make another film for seven years at the prime of my you know, professional life. Uh, I was 34, uh, I think, and, uh, and did not work for seven years. You know, uh, uh, it's pretty, pretty intense and painful time in my life because I, I think I had, I was afraid to not do as well as those movies. You know, I, I had, like, I, I had fear of, you know, the thing that happens is like, you know, when you're at first starting to go there, you have nothing to lose. It's always more fun to make your first movie. People think, oh my God, it's so hard to make your first movie. But once you have had a little bit of success, you have a lot more to lose you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and I had seven painful years that, uh, where I helped other people make movies, uh, but I didn't make a, a, a movie myself. I wish I could get them back. Uh, I wish I could have put my fear away and, and just taken a risk and done it. In fact, I wrote a script and I, you know, I got financing and actors and I, I said no <laughs> uh, after writing a script for a year and a half at one point. 
So, um, but what got me out of it was Michael Sarah, mm. just a 19 year old, super talented actor. You know, Bob Weinstein wanted me to do uh, this movie, Youth in Revolt with him. Mm -hmm. And I just adore him. And, you know, I, I got such contagious energy from his youthful, super smart energy. I got, I met him and was like, do you want to throw away this script and start from page one? And he was like, yeah. And <laughs> we wrote a whole script in two months and, uh, and shot it. So I feel like all my writer's block evaporated thanks to his energy. I owe him a lot. That's amazing. Wow. Um, I, I think right now I'm kind of going through that phase <laughs> of being stuck. I'm so sorry um, to hear that. It's painful. Oh, no, no, no. But it's not like I'm like completely stuck that where I can't write or I can't do anything else or, or you know, but that kind of sense of like timidness or fear, you know, is kind of brewing or it has been, you know, as you said, um, you articulated it so well, Miguel, about <laughs> that situation for me. I don't know. I think like my, my sense of, I don't have a specific sense of like, oh, I failed at that moment and I continued on or anything like that. I feel like I've been really fortunate with my um, luck of having, you know, four films that are independent me made and something that I wrote and and I feel incredibly lucky to be able to do that it's just that now I'm like oh I I feel like I'm being too precious now like I was talking about that other script that I've been trying to you know cast and finance and stuff instead of just going out there to tell a story so I feel like right now I'm going through that phase of um, you know reconsidering what storytelling is for me so that's yeah, that's the most challenging process right now. <laughs> and there is time. So there is time. I just watched Bur Burning, the Korean movie Burning. Oh, it's so amazing. I know. Oh, he was 62, I think, when he made oh. that. He's just he, he's like on top of his game. You yeah. Know? So, yeah. Bong so, and Lee Chung Dong both are amazing. Yeah. Please take the pressure off yourself and just, you know, don't give a, an F and just go do it. <laughs> Please, we need more movies from you. You know, Jonathan Demi called me. Uh, he was my mentor, my idol. He's helped me get started. And uh, um, the best phone call I ever got after The Good Girl, he called and left a message in my answering machine saying, this is Jonathan. What a great American picture. I love that. And then he ended up by saying, make another one fast. And he hung up. <laughs> And I didn't make another one for seven years. I could not believe it. I let him down so much. So I'm telling you now, make another one fast, fast, do it. That's, that's great advice. I was, I was, I was, I want to jump in here to ask you about the, the TV show version of In Between Days, because, oh, yeah. uh, like, that strikes me as, as a fascinating idea. I have to, like, is that going to be quite, like, sort of totally, presumably somewhat similar to the movie, but, but stylistically like can, can you tell me about the way that you, you're sort of reimagining the uh the movie for for a, a tv format yeah because um in the original script that i wrote it's it's really about a group of kids teenagers and that was all kind of stripped away to focus on amy and her love interest so uh, i'm kind of going back to the original concept of this um it's really um me, myself and a group of friends that I kind of ran with. Um, so yeah, and it's, it's, it's set in the 90s. So it's very period specific. And it's in L it's set in Los Angeles instead of Toronto. So the tone is, you know, quite different, but I still want to retain the intimacy that you feel, con you know, with the characters and, and, um, you know, ha have this connection to these kids who are going through very specific, you know, time in their lives. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I kind of wanted to be like, um, not just Amy, but change perspective and point of view to different characters who are, who are my best friends, you know, growing up and yeah. I, I see, I think, I think there's a member of uh, KGB, uh, Koreans gone bad in, in the, in, in, among the attendees, uh, Andrew Ahn. Um, are you are you sort of 
Are you going to be enlisting any of the the KGB gang to you know if if the show gets uh, um, gets greenlit? Uh, I like to Andrew. He's listening. <laughs> but I, you know, I asked Andrew to uh, help me put the flyer on social media because I don't have social media. <laughs> so he was teasing that he was going to sign on and watch. Well, he's here, and uh, and you know, yeah, big big fan of big fan of his work as well. I uh, so. Um, I mean, I, I, we've there was a question about about you, sort of your future projects, and I guess we've heard from you so uh, a little bit about that. But Miguel, can you can you talk about the project that you're in post on, and anything else that's kind of in the works? Oh, Miguel, you're you're muted still. Sorry, I have a, a Netflix movie uh, with uh, Je Jennifer Gardner called Yesterday. It's a family movie. You know, she does this thing where she lets her kids, uh, it, she says yes to anything they say for a whole day once a year. And uh, we made a movie about, about that, a fun movie that comes out next spring. And uh, I'm developing something with the writers that I did Getting On, that I work with. Uh, uh, they're wonderful writers, Mark and Will. Um, and we have two projects that we're developing. One is Tortilla Curtain, which is based on a T.C. Boyle novel. And the other one is uh, something that Jennifer Anderson has been producing for a long time about this group based on an article, uh, reality in a prison in Texas in the 40s, this group of women took instruments and created a band that be became one of the biggest radio shows is not very well known. So it's a period musical about prison life uh, that uh, we're gonna, Shailene Woodley is attached and we, we wanna do as a eight hour series. That sounds great. That sounds great. And going back to the Jennifer Garner thing, is that a, are you saying that's the thing that Jennifer does in real life? That or that? Yes, it's based wow. on a book called Yes, the children's book. Um, and uh, uh, but moms have started to do it in real life. They were like, you know, like let's. It might be nice, you know, with some parameters. You know, you can't kill anyone, and you can't spend more than this amount of time uh, uh, money on it. Uh, but uh, it's very liberating and kids don't ask, uh, you know, the, it's very weird because the kids, the first thing they tend to do is tell their parents, you can't use your phone or your computer. We have to be off, offline for the day, which is, I find very hopeful that there's any scenario in which kids are saying, let's get off our phones. So I, I think part of the reason I think she finds it so energizing is that, and she's, she's done it like eight years in a row. You can go into her Instagram and see, you know, the, you know they, they embarrass her, they make her dress in crazy ways and take her out to like, you know, Starbucks and like make her do all sorts of crazy things. Uh, uh, they really enjoy uh, uh, making her do a lot of uh, insane things during those yesterdays. But yeah, so she's been doing it and believes in it. And we made a movie with uh, uh, her husband is uh, Edgar Ramirez, who's incredible. So I got to do a mixed family with incredible kids and it'll be a fun, fun family movie coming your way excellent excellent well, I, I, th I'm, I think we have to wrap up but it's been so fantastic to to hear you in conversation uh, thank you for everybody here uh, just to, to reiterate um, you know there's a twenty dollar pass for for the talk has film film festival series on Kino marquee the uh, the URL is in the chat go and see all of uh, so and Miguel's movies in between days treeless mountain for Ellen love song Chuck and Buck good good girl youth revolt Cedar Rapids duck butcher all of them I know I haven't named all of them and, and of course watch all their TV shows um, and definitely uh, while you're kind of in that vein uh, go read uh, the pieces that both Miguel and, and so have written for talk house and um, there's also some a couple of excellent podcast that Miguel did uh, with Talkhouse with uh, Patrick Bryce and in, in one instance and Paul Feig and Alia Shawkat and the other. Uh, this has been such a pleasure. Uh, hopefully we'll see uh, a bunch of you next week for the Poison uh, Roundtable. Uh, but for me, Nick Dawson from So Young Kim and Miguel Ateta, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And, thank you Nick. And, and good night. Good night. Good night.